night? Yeah, I had some fun last night. Yeah, no, this conference has been great. You know, year one, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to be here. It's like that was allowed to come. Uh, but Tyler's a good guy. This is a good conference. A lot of work goes into putting this stuff up. So, you know, go out of your way to say thank you to the people who organize this stuff because it's a lot of work. And he did it almost all himself. So, well, maybe not all himself, but it was a lot of work. So, uh, I am Thomas Richards. I am a senior security consultant for what used to be Citadel, which is now Synopsys. Uh, they acquired us uh, last December. Uh, I do penetration testing and you know all that stuff that comes with being a security consultant. I'm also our red team domain lead. So internally, uh, I am responsible for overseeing what we call red teaming as a practice, as well as social engineering, physical pen testing. Uh, I oversee like the, the knowledge management of that, SAO templates and client calls and all that jazz. Uh, that's my Twitter. If you want to follow me, that'd be awesome. I usually get like two followers per talk. So I hope to keep up that trend. Uh, I have also been a volunteer for B-Sides Rock in the past. It's a you know, security conference over in Rochester, about three hours away from here. Uh, it's been growing steadily every year, uh, but it's been going pretty good. And I have spoken before at several other conferences, B-Sides, San Francisco, Carolina Con, DerbyCon. GurkCon is my favorite in Grand Rapids. That guy is amazing, and my phone's annoying me. Uh, and AppSec DC. And now AnyCon, I get to add to my list. And B-Sides Philly, too. I was at Philly last year. That was a good conference, too. All right, so who here is responsible or participates in security testing within their organization? That's awesome. Okay, so uh, how many of you, as part of that testing, do any sort of social engineering or physical pen testing uh, as part of that? That's usually what I get. About one person does that sort of testing uh, on top of their security program. So the purpose of this talk is we're going to go over, you already have a security program, which is awesome, and you're doing testing, but we're going to talk about ways to bring in adversarial emulation into your testing and to basically bring your testing program to the next level uh, by adding in this holistic approach to security. So what is red teaming? The classic uh, definition of red teaming is challenging a group's preconceived notions, assumptions, and or processes. Right? It's breaking out of groupthink. Uh, this can function in one of three ways. Uh, vulnerability probes, which is penetration testing, what we do. It's also simulations, sort of like war gaming, doing like what if situations, and alternate analysis. So getting a body of information, uh, look at it from a non-biased view to see if you arrive to the same conclusion as the group that first provided the analysis. A little bit of history in red teaming. Uh, it's actually really, really old, right? Humans have been doing it for a while. Uh, probably the best example comes from the Catholic Church about uh, the devil's advocate. So that devil's advocate was actually a real position within the Catholic Church. And the purpose of that position was to question the evidence that was provided for people that were being nominated for sainthood. So in order to be granted a saint in the Catholic Church, you have to have uh, perform some sort of miracle, right? So the devil's advocate, his their role, his role, because it would have been a man, uh, was to question that evidence and to challenge it and to say, you know, how do we know that's real? Interesting enough, uh, Pope John Paul II got rid of this position in the 90s, and after that, there was a huge spike of saints going in the Catholic Church. So when someone says devil's advocate, that was a, there's a Latin word for that too, but I don't remember what it is. Uh, but there's, that was a real position in the church to question that. Uh, the military has used red teaming ever since there was militaries. Uh, most notably during the Cold War uh, was a lot of game theory development and uh, a lot of uh, worrying about what the Russians were going to do. Right? Like, how would the Russians react to what we do now? How are we going to react if the Russians do something? So that's where red teaming was more formalized in the military. Uh, and the CIA also developed what they call the red cell. So that's where the alternate analysis came in. So what the red cell would do is they would take a body of intelligence information. So say like the Cuban Missile Crisis is a good example. Uh, they would get this body of information and you know the analyst who's been studying Cuba would go, hey, this is, you know, these are missiles, right? And try to get something done. But they're in this mind of groupthink, right? If all you do is worry about Cuba doing something bad, you're probably going to find Cuba doing something bad, 
right? Or Russia doing something bad or see something that it's not for what it is. So what the red cell will do is they would provide an alternate analysis on this information. So they would be removed from uh, the group that would be doing the intelligence gathering analysis, take that information and see if they can come to the same conclusions uh, as the group that performed the first batch of testing. Uh, the government also does uh, vulnerability probes, and most only, you know, the Homeland Security and other organizations uh, would do uh, vulnerability probes on core infrastructure to see if uh, it was vulnerable. Uh, the F Federal, the Aviation, FAA, yeah, the FAA um, did a lot of vulnerability probes in airports. Yes. Why are you guys in the video? I don't know. What are you, are you doing HDMI? I am doing HDMI. I am sorry. I have a thing, I have a thing. Don't let people think HMI is evil. Oh, why did I? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me use this one. I don't know what your thing is doing. It's an alt left. It's on a English thing. Oh, globalist. We're recording, Adrian. We're recording, Adrian. It's whatever people ever conspiratorialize about. It's my bad in this case. I have, I have my thing. I have my thing. Sorry, 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 sorry. You see the DJ not? No, there's no, there's no big no signal there that says no signal. So plug this in. I have mine. Oh, you have VGA. Yeah, I just did VGA. I just did VGA. I, I hate the HDMI cable. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Jeez. But now I have no signal to the projector. So what's up with that? Yeah, and you have no signal? <laughs> 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 yeah. Wait. Yeah, I'm using. Try this. Try that. Oh. And you're plugging in the USB too? She's so, so shady. Oh, well, it likes that one. I heard the beep. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. Oh, boy. I'm not starting over. That's fine. <laughs> Okay. All right, so I'm definitely like way behind on everything and I don't want to keep you guys over. So I'm going to skip that one story. Okay, so in the red in the red teaming in the infosec context, okay? Uh we're going to look at it as just vulnerability probes, right? That's what we do. If someone says red teaming, they think uh offensive attacks, right? So they're worried about, uh, we go, we're probing the organization, looking for vulnerabilities, what we're probing is trying to remediate them so that the organizations don't have those issues anymore, right? Uh, how we define red teaming and how um, and a lot of terminology gets mixed around, uh, what we look for is it's a goal-oriented assessment where testers attempt to emulate a perceived adversary and use any means necessary within scope uh, to achieve the goal, right? So we're not just doing a bug hunt. We're not just looking for, you know, all the vulnerabilities within the organization. We're looking for ways to attack that goal. That goal is in mind. Uh, and when I say within scope, uh, usually everything's in scope. Uh, sometimes clients take out the physical pen testing portion of it. And they want us to be this remote adversary, which is fine. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure we have all the means necessary, not just network attacks, mm -hmm. not just application attacks. We want to call your users. We want to be able to send phishing emails. Uh, that sort of thing. I've also done some risk assessments uh, where we look at a process and interview staff and figure out what could go wrong and do a bunch of what if uh, situations with that system. Uh, there was one, there was a, a client we were working with uh, that they worked as an intermediary between uh, hedge funds and the clients. So they received the paperwork from the hedge fund to like move the money in and out of the accounts and they never actually met or saw the people who were moving these millions of dollars through them, 
they never met them. It was all through paperwork. And when we looked at it, they were literally moving millions of dollars by email. <laughs> yeah, there was uh, there were there were controls in place. That is, I don't know. That's how Bitcoin works, right? Just fucking. <laughs> is that what you do all the time? You just send millions of dollars through email? You try not to? Okay. Uh, <laughs> but we, they actually had a lot of controls in place. So we did find ways um, that there would be inside insider collusion uh, to cheat the system. It was very really hard outside to cause money to move when it's not supposed to, but we found a number of ways inside to move money and actually try to move some money, and they did not like that at all. Uh, but that's that's one way, right? So we're looking at a system or a process or a team and seeing, is it secure? Not just testing the application this group used, but understanding the policies around it, how the application works, how the people use the application, and the flow of everything from getting an email to actually moving the money, what safeguards did they have in place? That was an interesting game. All right, so why why do this sort of testing in your group, right? So usually in an organization, as was demonstrated in my intro questions, some of you will do network-only tests. You'll do application-only tests. You'll test the mobile applications too. Right, but where these technology domains overlap, and when people start to get involved, gaps will exist that won't be caught in normal testing. Right, if I do um, a network pen test, we're looking at all the servers and looking for issues, but we don't necessarily know how those servers are supposed to interact with one another when it actually is doing something. Right, we're just looking at the software. Checking the port, seeing the version, is it vulnerable, right? Is there any configuration issues? But we, and the business logic is usually saved for like an application pen test. What this will do, what Red Teaming will do, will test the security posture of your entire organization. So not just looking at that network stack. We will look at your whole organization, your people behind it. Are your policies going to work, right? So now you'll get a true picture of your organization's security posture as it's being attacked from some sort of threat. As I said, not just a bug hunt. And this te this uh, one was pr a perfect example of this. So we had a red team against a firm. Uh, they had a limited external footprint. We weren't allowed to do any physical pen testing, which it actually, the, we're doing another one for the same client starting tomorrow. And they said, well, no, Monday. It's already Monday. And we get to do uh, the physical pen testing portion this time. So we're really excited about that one. Uh, but they have a limited external footprint. Uh, but we could still fish, and we got some credentials and stuff. But what we found was the client used an SFTP server to transmit information between themselves and their clients, right? Plus one, right? Not using plain text, you know, using good crypto, using good software, everything. However, this version of SFTP was running on a Windows box. Kind of weird, like, why wouldn't you just spin up a Linux box? But whatever. Uh, but it also accepted SSH. Right. And with that, the, if you connect on SSH with the valid credentials, it would drop the connection after about five seconds because you weren't supposed to have shell access. But the users had shell access for about five seconds before the connection was dropped. In those five seconds, we were able to launch a PowerShell command, which got us Cobalt Strike Beacon and we were on the box and we were able to escalate up to admin, and then we're in the DMZ. And once we got admin on the box, we were able to dump the creds, find the actual administrator credentials, have domain admin, and we took over their whole network within a matter of a couple hours just because they had an SSH server listening. Now, in a normal network pen test, right, we would have looked at that, checked the version of it, and just moved on. We wouldn't have known they had a huge gap in their uh, infrastructure that allows someone to take over their entire network because they listen to SSH. That's the difference between just doing a normal network pen test and then spinning up doing red teaming, where we're actually going in trying to figure out what's what can happen and attacking the system. <coughs> Businesses are concerned with threat actors, right? They're worried about internal or external threats, uh, whether it's the market, a competitor, adversaries, nation states. Uh, 
you know, just rogue hacker groups, ransomware, wanna cry, right? I love how something happens every time before I give this talk and I can reference it. Uh, you know, what, what will happen? We actually had a couple clients ask us to emulate a uh, ransomware attack, which was, we didn't get to execute on those, but it would have been fun to do. Um, so with red team testing, we try to attempt and emulate these threat actors and how they would attack the organization. So we look at their techniques, make sure we emulate the tool sets that they have, the skill level, and usually the client will define for us the targets. Uh, sometimes they'll ask us to find the targets, which is fine. Uh, but usually they say, okay, we're really worried about our payroll system. We're worried, we're really worried about our source code. We're really worried about, you know, our employee information or our client's database or credit card information. And that's what we will target and go after in this test. Before you can proceed into Red Team, and you really have to be able to know more about your organization than you might already know, right? Because everything's documented all the time, right? Um, you know where every asset is, the IP address, what it does, and everything that's supposed to be decommissioned. Uh, another Red Team we did uh, was for a law firm, and we found access to a system that didn't have two-factor, which was the only system in their external footprint that didn't have two-factor, and it had access to all their client information going back to 2010. And this is a this was a big deal law firm that like handles huge mergers and acquisitions. So we had very sensitive information. When I was on the readout call with them and told them about this server, because that's how we got the information the first time, they said to us, what server did you use? Like, oh, this IP address, you know, this software it's running, it has a Samba connection right into your share. They're like, that was supposed to have been turned off five months ago. That was a test server that someone spun up so we can see if the software was going to work. And that's not supposed to be on. They turned it off on the call. They said, can you just go check, see if that IP address is up like right now? Like they muted the mic, yelled at someone to go turn it off. They're like, that's not supposed to be up. So you have to know your assets, right? Because you have to know what you're going to go after. Your information, your technological assets, uh, your physical assets, your buildings, what do they look like, what security controls there, and also your business processes. What is supposed to happen when someone calls help desk, right? What are your methods of verification? Do those work to stop someone from impersonating someone else? So the basic elements of a red team, when we look at it, we have uh, the electronic which we know, you know, your network infrastructure, uh, your applications, your servers, everything. Your social, which is your people, as well as uh, your social footprint, I lump uh, email addresses and phone numbers into that too, and your physical assets as well uh, that you would test. So your buildings and everything. So where that meets in the middle is where red teaming comes together, right? Where everything comes together, what happens? Examples of electronic, your software, your web apps, your thick clients, uh, any applications that you use on your desktop, uh, your network, your external and internal networks, you know, IP addresses, servers, et cetera, your wireless networks, those are fun to test, uh, any mobile technologies that you have in place, as well as embedded technologies. We've taken over, you know, uh, alarm systems, well, not, uh, security systems support, and PBXs. You know how much fun that is? The consultant that's been doing a lot of red teaming stuff for us, he loves getting on, like, the PBX and getting into phone calls that clients are having. It was funny, he was on one, uh, he took over the PBX, and there happened to be a conference call going on with a lot of the executive staff, and they were talking about a new data center they were gonna roll out. And they were talking about uh, the security for this data center, and someone on the call said, oh, you know, we're doing like X, Y, and Z, and the consultant that was on the call, that wasn't supposed to be on the call, but he got into their PBX and was having fun, uh, he actually has a lot of experience in data center security. So he started piping up and giving them like advice about what they should do for their data center security. And everyone's like, oh yeah, that's a really good idea. Like <laughs> I just jumped in the conversation and was having a good time. And it wasn't until after the call that someone go, cause the, our, our point of contact was on the call and he knew, uh, the consultant's voice, but no one else did. So someone goes, who, who was that on the phone? Like that was, they had really good ideas. <laughs> Uh, so that was, that's fun. 
All right, social. Oh, we talk about the phone numbers, your social media accounts, your corporate and your personal. What are your employees posting? For that law firm I was talking about before, we found employees were like very proud of their their desks and their offices when they moved, uh, but they had case files on the desks when they were taking pictures of everything, and I can read client names on it. I was like, this is bad. Um, one of the few times we got to stalk people on Facebook, that was fun. Uh, email addresses, right? What's your email address scheme? As well as your business processes, you know, what do your CSRs do? What are your scripts that you're doing? You know, what happens if you call your main number? Do you have a person? Is it automated attendant? And what's supposed to happen when someone interacts with your company? Your physical, your facilities, your access control technologies, uh, your badging process, you know, what sort of badges do you use? Did you actually upgrade the high frequency cards or are you still using the easy to clone low frequency cards, which most are using low frequency cards still, still. It's crazy. I actually had a client, um, they had two buildings across the street from each other. We do a physical pen test and the one building used high frequency and the other building used low frequency because there were two different management companies. So they had to find cards that accepted both. So we were able to clone, you know, the low frequency ones pretty easy. Um, and the high frequency ones, we just, you know, followed someone in. But, and it was good because they walked between the two offices constantly. So we just had to hang out on the street for a little while and just bump up some guests to people to get some badges. It was great. Um, all right. So building an in-house red team. So when you're looking to put this all together, after you figure out everything about your organization and know what you're going to target and everything, uh, there's several things that need to fall into place for this team to, to function, right? On top of doing just normal pen testing. You need uh, a good team dynamic. You know, you need leaders and you need assessors. You need excellent managerial support because red team will ruffle feathers. It will upset people. It's not just doing, I mean, you know how much security testing upsets people. What happens if like you lie to someone and they fall for it and they give you all their information and you take over the, the network, right? Like they're not happy then. And then you also want to have like run books or guides in place, documentation for the team uh, on how to deliver the technical aspects of the assessment when you're going through it. So as you rotate staff or you have attrition and everything, there's still like a, a knowledge transfer a bit so that someone coming in can understand what your team is doing, you know, in the parameters that have been defined by your organization. Effective red teams, you know, need to be placed somewhere in the org's personnel chart, of course. Uh, they need to be semi-independent. So you want to be like the highest as possible because you don't want the middle managers to be able to get in and tell you you can't do something. So you have to be placed very strategically on the org chart with the least possible levels of management. And you want to be far away to remove bias, but close enough so that people will listen to you. For the red team, you need a leader, obviously. Uh, you want this to usually be a senior member of the organization. Uh, they should have boots on the ground experience. Uh, they know, you know, how to perform these assessments because they're going to be looked for for advice and guidance when these assessments are going on. Uh, you also want someone who's good at motivating the testers because hackers are very interesting people to work with. And it, you can't talk to us like you would a normal person and really motivate us to work, right? Like we're excited about completely different things than what a software developer is excited about or what HR is excited about, right? Uh, and they also want to be responsible for setting the goals and performing oversight of the assessment. The assessors, these are the people that need to be able to think maliciously Right, being able to cheat, think out the box, look at a system and think, how am I going to use this wrong or in a different way that's not intended to achieve my goal? Right. You want people with varied backgrounds, you know, some network support, some development in IT support, uh, mis miscellaneous stuff, right? Like who knew soldering was going to be useful in my job? But it is because I get to make stuff and it's, sometimes it's useful for when I'm on an engagement. Lock picking, right? It was a hobby until I got paid to do it. Um, which was awesome. So these people have to be comfortable with liner cheating and stealing and stealing within reason, right? You have to know that boundary, uh, but you're going to have to still put on that face and be that actor when you're doing the assessment uh, to make the assessment go forward. And they're going to be the ones conducting the engagements, right? They're going to be the ones that are going to be on the ground, you know, doing this work. You need managerial support. The right team will live or die from this. And you need executive support because it's going to ruffle feathers. People are going to be annoyed because the system that they thought is secure, if you actually attack it and they find it's not secure and say it's like your you know, flagship product and platform, it's going to upset a lot of people. 
right? So you need to have upper level support who can defend the group and also, uh, you know, quell any inter-organizational issues and navigate that crazy business stuff that we always don't get into uh, and under and communicate the benefits of the red team and have visible outcomes of security, right? Just doing testing is fine, but you need to have some sort of metrics. You know, are we getting better? We're spending X. Are we getting better in our organization? What's improved? Can we measure that improvement? So that's where this managerial support will come in. Uh, getting the managerial support, uh, you want to make sure you have, you know, stated goals for the red team. Like it should have some sort of uh, mission statement that will say, you know, we are, you know, doing X, right? Like whatever the red team is supposed to do should be knowledgeable to everyone. Uh, the mission statements are good because it helps to keep the team on track, right? So as long as you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, as broad or as uh, defined as it is, you want to make sure the team is following those. And then these can explain, you know, be explaining risks that the red team can discover. So what I talked about in the beginning of the talk, uh, where these knowledge gaps miss, uh, where the gaps happen for the technological assets, where everything overlaps, where there's issues, the examples I gave, like those are good things to bring up, right? Like we would have missed that in our how we're testing now. We need to test differently. We need to test better to make sure we don't miss those things in the future. You'll get common pushbacks. You know, some organizations have told us, oh, my users will always fall for a phishing attack. We don't have to fish. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's... <laughs> Let's talk security awareness training, right? Like, what what are we doing? Um, is it is it going to work? Let's test it anyway. Uh, and when clients have also said this to us, we will go to them. Okay, then just give us a set of credentials, and we'll see what we can do. And a lot of times they they we've done quite a bit of those. Will give us creds, so they'll assumed compromise. What we call them, right? So they'll give us a good set of creds and let us just go to town with those. Uh, how different is this from normal testing? I've been covering that this whole talk, so hopefully you've learned what that is. The slides are up, the recording has been up, even though we missed half of it. Um, you know, explain what the difference is, is and why you're not doing something already within your testing program. Uh, my system network application is doing anything sensitive. We won't be a target. Yes, you are. If you're on the internet, you're a target. Uh, now with ransomware especially, right, they're not even going after what you're organization does, they don't care. They're just looking to get money, right? So that, that should be a threat. And what organizations are worried about, you know, how susceptible are we to that? Which WannaCry actually had a really small infection rate compared to like Blaster and Code Red and, you know, and all those other worms that have happened years by, uh, you know, they were like 300,000. Yeah, and Blaster was in the millions. Or Configure, too. Configure was in the millions as well. Like, that was crazy. But it was more devastating because it just destroyed everything. If only Bitcoin was around in the early 2000s. Uh, like I've been talking about, uh, the red team engagement will, will ruffle feathers, right? Because it will focus on the sensitive bits of your organization, things that people uh, thought were correct or in place the right way might be discovered to not be in the right way or correct or secured at all if you start looking at it from a different angle, right? So as I mentioned before, the stakeholders in engagement should have enough influence to stand up to any political threat, right? Because there will be inner office politics, there will be people, you know, annoyed, upset, but they need to be brought into it and shown that, hey, you know, we're bettering everything, right? We're looking at it differently. We're trying to make the organization better and more secure, right? We're not here to just, you know, crap on everything. We, we don't want to be hacked, right? So that's why you're going to red team. You want this, uh, this red team runbook, right? You want some sort of guide for assessors. You don't want it to be a prescriptive, you know, step by step things because red teaming by itself is not step by step. It's very, uh, we call it crimes of opportunity, right? You never know what you're going to find when you're there. So you have to be prepared for anything sometimes. And you want this to cover the phases of the assessment. So you want it to give, you know, overview of what, you know, the different phases will be so that someone can figure this out and carry out these assessments with some guidance, you know, after viewing documentation. And you want it to be a living document, right? It's not going to be written once and forgotten about 
and never updated. You want this to be constantly updated and improved as team members go through assessments. It's sort of like a, a learning thing. So like, what did you learn after this assessment? What did we do wrong? What could we do better? And what little tool did we try to use that didn't work for the first four hours we were messing with it, and then we finally figured out how to use it. Let's document that so the next team doesn't have an issue trying to figure out the tool for four hours, right? So phase one, when you're going through the red team, is usually the reconnaissance phase, right? This is where you're going to get all the information gathering for the assessment. You're going to do open source intelligence, you know, what are the IP address ranges, what do the phone numbers, what are the phone numbers, what do the email addresses look like, you know, can you figure out how many messages can you find? This phase never truly ends. You're always learning as you're going through the assessment. And we've sometimes completely changed our attack pattern because of something we found mid-assessment uh, that didn't come up in the first round of reconnaissance. And there's passive and active reconnaissance. So passive is the Google dorking. It's not actually touching the organization. Active reconnaissance is when you start touching the organization. You know, we're going to look at what is on that port. You know, not just the IP address ranges, but what is live, what's going on. Looking at passive recon, like I said, uh, looking up DNS entries, you know, trying to brute force DNS entries and find interesting hosts. Where's the webmail? Where are some employee portals that someone might be going into? Uh, Google hacking, getting the IP address information, uh, especially the who is information, who owns those IP addresses. Email is harboring, and if we're doing physical testing, we're going to look at Google Maps, right? We're going to try to figure out what does the building look like from the air and the street, what's around it, uh, what are some possible uh, entry points that we would be doing. Again, active, where we will actually, uh, you know, touch the ports, start port scanning, see what's out there. Uh, call support numbers to figure out what happens. You know, find their IT support number and call up and say, hey, I'm Joe Schmo, I forgot my password. And see what they require to reset the password. There was a client we had on the West Coast. And what we did, we, uh, I called them, you know, like our morning time. So it was like 5 a.m. their time. All the numbers that we found to get the recordings on the voicemail. So people usually say, you know, hi, this is Nancy. You know, I'm not here right now. Leave a message, right? So I'd get all the employees' names from their voicemails. And then during business hours, their business hours, I would call and say, oh, hi, Nancy. This is Tom from IT. Just to establish that, you know, level of that rapport with them. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Except for when the one person actually answered the phone at 5 o'clock in the morning on the West Coast. And I was like, what? Go to sleep. And I hung up the phone. I <laughs> go like... You're not supposed to be awake right now. Uh, well, that was fine. Uh, vulnerability scans. Uh, so we'll, you know, do, you know, some run Nessus and stuff at the organization and then also look at on-site observations. So we'll be outside of the building, you know, figure where the smoke spots are, where employees coming in and out, you know, what do they, what are they dressed like? What kind of badges do they have? Uh, that's where the active recon, like we're on-site trying to figure out if I have to pretend to be an employee for this company, what do I have to look and act like in order to do that? We actually cloned, uh, we got pictures of badges for this one company, and I didn't have a good printer, so we just went to like the hotel lobby and like used the hotel printer to print stuff out, and I just mocked something up in paint and put it in a badge holder, and it wasn't a real badge, it was just a piece of paper. And I walked by the security guard, oh yeah, here's my badge, and just kept going. Yep, in a piece of paper, in a hotel lobby, it was nuts. We have better tools now, obviously, but that was that was fun. Uh, attack planning. So after you get all your information, you start to figure out, okay, how am I going to go after the goal? So you look at the intelligence you've got during recon, identify you know vulnerabilities or paths in uh, to achieve these goals, right? And now we're going to start to prepare for the exploitation. So next phase, exploitation. Uh, we're going to actively go after the organization at this point. So we are sending the phishing emails. We are Popping vulnerable services, which, to be very honest, we find very few vulnerable services externally uh, that like actually have you know code execution. It happens from time to time, but usually orgs have good external security. It's the internal that they never patch anything. Uh, so we'll start to follow the attack path that we've created. Uh, this could change at any moment. Someone could spin up a new server. You know, someone might not follow through for the phishing attacks, and we have to start calling people to get them to do something. Right. So there's all sorts of things we have to do depending upon the organization to make sure that the assessment achieves the goals. We'll start physically entering the building. So we will tailgate people, we'll try to RF clone, and we'll try to do covert entry in the middle of the night 
We make sure we don't set off any alarms, and have the police show up. But that's what we'll do. We'll try to achieve those goals. Uh, post exploitation, after we get that initial foothold, you'll go through and start to, uh, you know, lateral movement within the organization to achieve those goals, right? Okay, so you got on this server, but we have to find HR. So where's HR? And you have to figure out where those servers are, where the information is, and get over there, right? And then you have to keep going through everything, find, you know, additional systems, right? So more recon. Now we're inside. What else can we find? And you want to go after the target data and possible exfiltration. We had a client set up uh, like a, a dev server. It was a dummy server that had sensitive information, but it wasn't, you know, real sensitive information. It was fake. And they were trying to tune their um, DLP solution to look for stuff going out. Right from the service, so they had it tuned very, uh, very well to look for, you know, what looked like credit card numbers and social security numbers leaving the network, and we were able to exfiltrate out of this dummy server the information back to our servers. Right, so that was a a real attack. Right, so they the client was worried about is will my DLP work? You want to have a big bag of tricks for your testers, right? You want to be able to have all the tools, both common and specialized tools, to achieve the goals on this thing. So you're not going to know what you're going to run into, right? So you need a couple sets of lockpicks. You need a couple sets of uh, shims. You need all these small things to, to carry out these assessments. And you want to have them ready to go for when you need them. Also, in-house tools, right? You'll start to build scripts, um, Phishing templates, you know, like website templates, stuff to spin up stuff at Amazon if you're using Amazon for anything. Uh, but you want to have these tools ready to go too. We do have several, you know, like in-house pre-made uh, phishing attacks that have been successful over time. So we save those for other consultants to just keep using, right? If it works, why change it? Uh, but yeah, that's a good starting point for people. You know, you want to have those things ready to go so that as there's attrition in the group or a staff changes over, you still have that body of knowledge. Like, here's how we had landing pages for phishing, you know, last year. You know, do we want to make changes to that? What else can we do? So when we're looking about putting it all together, right, the red teaming in this context, you know, not just general offensive testing, but red teaming will add another layer to your security program that might not already be there. Right, there's gaps, there's stuff that you're testing that you might not uh, have tested before. You want to make sure you find those vulnerabilities before an adversary does. Right, uh, you want to make sure you have managerial support, very critical for the red team to function and execute. You want uh, proper red team dynamic, you know, good leaders, good assessors. You want to make sure you have good outcomes from this. You want to have you know documentation that the outcomes are actually beneficial. And that there's metrics and improving in the program. And you also want proper process tools, documentation to keep the red team flowing in the face of staff changes or any challenges to why the team is there or functioning. Okay. So, thank you. <laughs> Whew. Okay, any questions? Yes. There was one assessment we had a couple years ago where we were not successful. Um, there was for there was a number of reasons behind why we weren't successful that we can talk about after if you want. But there has been times we were not successful or as successful as we should have been, uh, and that is part of consulting. You know, sometimes orgs have a really good security posture, right? And that's what we're there to validate. Um, it happens very rare <laughs> that we that we don't get in. Yeah. Um, right, like of all the ones we've done, I can think of one, right? Um, but it happens. Yeah, no, there's always, yeah, there's always something to learn, right? It's never a total bust. I mean, we had findings on it. We just didn't get to the internal network. We didn't get to what we were achieved to do. Um, there was a lot of stuff to learn from that assessment. Uh, but we, you know, for the client learned a lot, and then we learned a lot too. You know, you're always going to learn on an assessment. Every assessment is different. That's why I love consulting. You know, every gig is going to be, even if it's the same test for the same client, you know, year after year, it's always different. So, you know, you're always going to learn something on an assessment.
that other individual had a hand up. You had a question, sir? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like we'll we'll always have like a readout call with the client after the fact, you know, to talk about the assessment. And sometimes like they'll be able to see what we've been doing, and they were like, "Oh, you know, like you were like really close." Uh, if it's a very cooperative client, sometimes we're not that cooperative. Uh, but you know, after the fact, you know, roundtable try to figure out what happened and how they can improve. You know, that's what that call is there for. So if we don't get all the way in and we say, "Well, we got like this far," if we had more time, right? Everything's time boxed. We only have, you know, X number of weeks to do these assessments. We don't have unlimited time that an attacker would have, right? That's why we have, we make certain assumptions on the gigs so that, you know, we know that we're not going to have all the time, but we still want to give the client the value or like your internal teams, the value of the assessment. So you make certain assumptions throughout the life cycle of this, like the assumed compromise I was talking about, you know, getting credentials ahead of time. You know, just give us creds. Give us, make a user that's a normal user in the network, you know, nothing special, and give us that credential to assume a compromise of someone else's credentials, right? And that saves time on the assessment. We can focus on the more important stuff then, if that's what they're worried about. Yes? Without going into details, <clears throat> how many times have you been called into one company multiple times over the course of a couple of years? So you found the exact same problem from day one or year one in year three, year two, year three? There's, there's a couple. Um, a lot of the orgs that we work with already have like security programs internal. So we find issues and then they will remediate them. We don't always find the same issues every time, but we find new issues. Right. Cause we know, okay, we got the low hanging fruit. Now we have to go after something big. Right. Uh, the gentleman back there had his hand up first, Rob. Uh, you don't run from the police, number one, especially when you're on an engagement. Like, we're authorized to be there. So we'll carry um, uh, get-out-of-jail-free cards, right? So it's a letter on the company letterhead with a whole bunch of number of contacts and, like, our names, our company names, and, you know, the company information. So when the police, you know, show up, uh, we present this documentation saying, like, we're on the job, we're authorized to do this testing, here's the proof, and then the police will go and usually call the numbers on it uh, and val verify with those people that we are legitimately allowed to be there and to test. Yes, the numbers that were provided. <laughs> but but how many criminals walk in with like a phone number, you know, like three levels of chain of, you know, uh, of of management to like validate that we're there. The police have sometimes made the people, you know, come to the office, like and physically verify that they're an employee there by using their badge. That's happened before. But right, the numbers we verify. Oh yeah, we're supposed to be there. Yeah. No, like criminal <laughs> I have never, I have never, um, one of our consultants has had a couple run-ins with police, um, when people turn stuff off when they weren't supposed to have turned stuff off, because uh, I know the testing is going on, uh, and, you know, no one's ever been arrested, you know, because especially when the police show up, we don't act like criminals, right? Criminals will run, they won't be wearing, you know, nice clothes, they, you know, it's, you, you give, <laughs> maybe they should wear nice clothes, right? Um, we won't give the perception that we're doing something wrong, right? So you want to have that confidence and know that you're not doing something wrong, to not act guilty, and that also will lessen the tension with the law enforcement. You had your hand up. Yes? Most of these engagements, when they're, you know, the red teams, the, our sponsors want to see how those teams will react to an attack. That's the other side of what we're testing. A lot of upcomers use this to test their incident response, right? So the, the lower level employees won't know this is happening, but someone on the escalation chain, usually like 
before it goes to the CEO or before it goes to law enforcement will know about our tests. So as long as someone doesn't go rogue and skip the, man the management chain, someone at the top will know it's going on and will validate with us if the attack was us and then go from there. We actually had a client ask us, um, I don't have the video on my laptop, but we were doing uh, a physical pen to a data center and we were tailgating people in. And, you know, after we've been in for a while, uh, the client goes to us, so did you also come in on the weekend? We're like, no. <laughs> they're like, so, so this isn't you. And they're like going through the video and they're like, no, that's not us. Uh, <laughs> um, they're like, okay, we got to go figure something out. Um, but right, so someone on the chain will know so that you can either figure out if the attack going on is you or is someone who is not you, which that's actually happened more <laughs> when someone's like, is this your IP address? And we're like, no. Is that, it's really not your IP address? No, no, that's not where we're coming from. Uh, I gotta go. You know? <laughs> sort of. Yeah, yeah. So before, right, before it gets escalated to the point of like crisis, uh, that person, yeah, that person knows about the test going on. Yes. Nothing's coming to mind right now, um, but we can talk more later and stuff. Anyone else? Yes. The people. The people. It's always the people. Like I said, very often do we find, like on external networks, something vulnerable to something, right? Like actual, you know, oh, I have a mess point module for this. That's pretty rare externally. Um, but it's usually the people that fail. Yes, one more and then we're going to end it. I work uh, part-time in field of education. And I'm surprised when I go to like ransomware attacks, like coming in with education. I'm not like shocked. Because that's, that's surprising to me. Like, I think that the information If it's a computer, they're going to go after it. Because they can't prevent it or they can't stop or it's like a you know, phishing policy. I, I mean, most of the ransomware attacks will start from phishing or they'll exploit, you know, a vulnerability somewhere. Uh, but they're just, they're looking to get money. So it doesn't matter if it's education or, you know, industry. They just want the money. So they'll go after any computer they can. Who's there when you say there? The criminal organizations running the ransomware. Criminal yeah, yeah. Yeah. They actually have, like, tech support. Did you know that for someone, like... <laughs> Yeah, I was reading a couple articles uh, on people who are making like uh, the ransomware attacks. If you paid a certain amount of money for the software to run the ransomware attack, they had tech support for you if you couldn't get the software to work and they had a phone number to call. Like, what? <laughs> like, I'm buying a prepackaged ransomware attack. Like, I'm just, you know, some script kitty going out to this. And if I have a problem, I can call someone and they'll offer me support to launch the ransomware attack. Like, that's a business model, but apparently it is. Uh, Right, so we're as a service, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your time. There you go.